Okay, hi everybody and welcome to my workshop on love. I want to thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it and I'm so excited to share the content that I have with you today in honor of Valentine's Day this month. I hope you all had a wonderful Valentine's Day. And I am gonna be sharing a lot of content from the life coaching program, the life coaching certification program that my sisters in our little cohort of the 10 of us and I graduated from almost a year ago. I think it's almost a year ago now. So we learned so much about relationships and love and how we think and how we view things and our perceptions. And there was so much rich content that I'm a lot of what I'm sharing in these workshops is to really spread the word about all the things that we learned and how much it's transformed my life and my coaching clients' lives and people who I've been able to share this information with. So I decided this year, I'm sure many of you decided at the beginning of the year that you wanted to have a resolution or a goal or do something different this year. That's really common, right? So I decided that I was going to push myself outside of my comfort zone and offer a free Zoom workshop every month that would be live and that I would just promote on social media, no paid advertising, so that it would be a small, intimate group of people who ever showed up. The January workshop was called Curb Your Cravings, where we talked about cravings for food and habits that aren't serving us and overuse of social media and over drinking and all of that sort of thing. And all of the great tools that I learned, not all of, but many of the great tools that I learned in my coaching program. And that went fantastic. There were, I think, eight or nine people there, got a lot of great feedback, and we're now editing that so that I can make it available for everyone else to see the video and to get the content. And so for February, of course, it's the month of love, Valentine's Day, so I decided to do a workshop on love. Now, next month, I really want to plant the seed for all of you and for anyone you know, next month's workshop, completely veering off from the life coaching work, and I will be offering on Women's Day, on International Women's Day, during Women's History Month, the Google I Am Remarkable Women's Empowerment Program. It is fantastic. I highly recommend it. It's for women and underrepresented groups and anyone who wants to learn about how to be confident, how to overcome modesty and the cultural social norms around not being speaking proudly about our accomplishments because the research really shows that women and other underrepresented groups are less likely to self-promote and speak up for themselves and ask for raises and promotions and to talk about their accomplishments. And so Google created this program. It's called I am remarkable and you can see it all over social media if you look up hashtag I am remarkable and I am certified in that program so I'm incredibly excited to offer that and it's going to be March 8th which is actually International Women's Day and it's going to be at the same time Saturday at 10 o'clock so I hope you'll come to that and I hope you'll spread the word about that really excited about that one so let's start talking about love let me start by quoting my our master coach instructor Brooke Castillo in the life coach school teaches a lot about love and her concepts on love are really different from what most of us learned about love in our lives so she says that in every situation and with every person love is always an option and love is always the best option that's a pretty powerful statement when you think about the complicated relationships we have in our lives, right? And the people who we have difficulty with. I have come to believe in the two plus years that I've been studying Brooke Castillo's work and, and other, many other self-help books and teachers and psychological principles. I've come to really embrace this in my life, this idea that we can love anyone and everyone and love is always the best option for us. Even if you know, regardless of the other person, that it feels good to feel love. And love is something we want to choose as much as we possibly can. And that loving someone else cannot hurt us, okay? That we may still choose not to have that person in our life or not to have anything to do with that person, but we can at the same time still choose to love them as they are. 
So this is a radical concept, I believe, and it's part of what we're going to talk about today, and it, that's the premise. I hope that you all had a chance to watch the short video that I sent out on unconditional love. It's a video by Brooke Castillo, who's the founder of the Life Coach School. I highly recommend that you watch it. If you haven't watched it, it really reinforces and sets the foundation for what we're talking about today. So let me talk about what we're going to cover, and I think Again, at any point, please jump in and ask a question in the chat box and give, a, give us a comment, an example, a challenge, anything you want to do to chime in at any point. I'm trying for this workshop to just do that through the chat box instead of having people ask questions on screen. But if you really want to come on screen, let me know and we'll bring you on because that's cool too. So. Just a friendly reminder, I think I just said this, we're gonna try to uh, keep everyone on mute and use the chat box for questions this time to minimize background noise. But I don't know, I may just say, let's see if anybody's out there. It's kind of lonely just talking. I assume you're all listening, hopefully, but I, I don't really have any way. I can't see you at this point since I'm recording. So, you know, I might ask at some point if, if we can put people on screen, if anybody has a question or wants to come on screen. So here's where we're going. Three main topics, self-love and lovability, unconditional love, and the grand finale, of course, what everybody, you know, is fascinated with and many people are obsessed with is that, you know, juicy, sexy topic of romantic love, right? So it's not all about romantic love, but we will get to that at the end. And I wanted to make this interactive and engaging as much as I can. I know that when I watch webinars and online workshops, sometimes I'm tempted to go on Facebook or to check email. So I'm going to really try to keep you engaged by asking you to take a little quiz. So within each of these three topics, I have two what I consider shocking facts about that topic. And I'm gonna ask you a question to start off, to kick off each of those six topics. And the question is gonna ask you for a number or a percentage, and I want you to guess, okay? Um, and that's how we'll go through each topic and kind of set it up and, and lead into it. And I hope that will help it to be memorable. So we're starting with self-love and lovability. And here's my question, okay? Who should you love the most in your life? Who should be the number one person who you have the most love and care for in your life? Now, I want to say, a little caveat here, um, some of us might be tempted to say God, right? And I totally get that and understand that. And that's, you know, that may be a given for many of you, many of us, but let's say, let me Say that this question is really geared toward human beings, okay? Human beings in physical form on the planet, like me, like you, who should be the person you love the most? Who should be the number one person in your life? So does anybody, will someone please take a guess in the chat box? And I'll take a look at the chat box. Okay, I think some of you are guessing. Let's see what we have here. So we have myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, you got it. Exactly right. 100%. Yes, congratulations. So here we go. Okay, back to my PowerPoint. You, you should love yourself the most. Isn't that shocking? Isn't that a new kind of concept, right? And look at this little baby. So my, my claim here is that this is how we're born. We are born loving ourselves the most. Look at this adorable, sweet little girl who is kissing herself in the mirror. And you can just feel her going, I see you. I love you. You are amazing. I see your, your beauty and your um, divinity and I love you the most. Now I know this is a controversial statement because for instance some of us have children, right? I have two children. I love my children more than life itself. But really I believe, I have come to believe that when we put ourselves first, when we fill ourselves up, take care of our own needs, make sure that we're happy and fulfilled and that we are just loving ourselves so much, we show up so much better as parents for our kids. So I don't want to say our kids are number two or number three. Maybe they can be number one as well, but we have got to be on par with that. We have got to be giving ourselves as much love as we have to give to any human being on the planet, right? And so... Has anybody heard of Louise Hay? If you've heard of Louise Hay, she's, she passed away 
uh, fairly recently, a couple years ago, I think, but she is very well loved and very well known in uh, health and wellness and healing and self-love. She wrote a book called You Can Heal Your Life, as well as many other books, has given many talks, is the really the head guru of a big movement of, of self-love and, and all sorts of other uh, wellness-related topics. And she has this exercise, well, she has what she calls mirror work. And she actually recommends that we should stand in front of the mirror and say, I love you to ourselves. And I agree with that and I've done it and it can be an amazing experience. So I want to encourage you to do that, to do the mirror work. And if it feels awkward and uncomfortable and silly, and if you can't look into a mirror and look into your own eyes and honestly say to yourself, I love you. I think there's some work to be done there because why can we say that to someone else? Why do we want someone else to say that to us, right? Everyone's hungry for that person to look longingly into your eyes and say, I love you, I love you so much. How can we really expect to be fully receptive to someone else saying that to us if we can't say it to ourselves? That's my question for you. And so I encourage you, you can even step away for a moment, go to a mirror, the nearest mirror, look in the mirror and say, I love you. You can also just do it in your own mind. I love you. Just say to yourself, I love you. And if you can't do it, really think about why. Because self-love is number one. It is most important. And all of the studies show this. So if you don't believe it, um, I can tell you that there are countless studies that show that people who have a healthy sense of self-esteem, who love themselves, who feel good about themselves, who have high self-worth, are far more successful, are far happier in their relationships with others, right? And are able to accomplish much more in life. So if you don't take it from me, take it from some of these very well-known people, right? Meghan Markle, the beloved Maya Angelou, who I am, you know, a huge fan of, hopefully you are too. Oh, excuse me, I just sneezed in my webinar, but that's okay because I love myself and I know I'm not perfect. So here we go. Beyonce, the world will see you and see you the way you see you and treat you the way you treat yourself, right? So many people say, many experts would say that others can only give us the degree of love and admiration and respect that we're able to give ourselves because that's our capacity for receiving it. We have to be able to give ourselves that love for, to be able to um, open the door for others to provide that. Even Lucille Ball, I was so excited to find this quote, right? From so many years ago, when women were really, you know, were looked at as second-class citizens, and look how confidently she said, you've got to love yourself first and everything else falls in line. You have to love yourself to get anything done in this world. So love yourself first. You are number one. Here's my next question, and this is a real one, and again, it's a number. This is the second concept under self-love and lovability, which is the first of the three topics. How lovable are you? What percentage do you think that you are lovable out of 100%? Someone guess. Somebody put in the chat. What percent lovable are you? 50%? 90%? I mean, maybe you've made some mistakes in life. You've hurt some people. You know, you got fired from a job. Someone broke up with you. So maybe, you know, what, where would you rate yourself based on all the things that you've experienced in your life, all the things that you've done in your life and have a feeling you're going to get the right answer. Oh, okay. So someone's saying 75%, someone's saying 100%, 100%. You are each, I am, we are all 100% lovable, no matter what, no matter what we've done no matter what mistakes we may think we have made, we are 100% lovable, okay? That is a non-negotiable. This is a concept that I learned in my coaching program, but it, it resonated with me so deeply and I knew it was true and it freed me from so much negative self-talk, from so much self-criticism and self-blame and ruminating on things from the past that was... I didn't need to do and that didn't serve me. Yes. So if you said less than 100%, if you said 70%, 75%, I really want to challenge you to change your thinking on that. 
and to change your number for yourself. It does not matter what you have done, what you have not done, mistakes you've made. You are 100% lovable, okay? All human beings have flaws, have made mistakes, have done things that they might go back and change. All those things have made you who you are today. You are 100% lovable, and guess what? So is everyone else. And other people will make mistakes. Other people may have done things that you don't like and you wish they hadn't have done. They're actually still 100% lovable. And everyone is doing the best that they can with what they have. Doesn't it make life easier? Doesn't it feel better to think about the possibility of believing that, even if you can't believe it right now? I don't know that I believed it at first when I first heard that, but I do now. And I want to share... Uh, some work by someone I love. So a, a group of, I love so many people and I believe, I now fully believe and embrace that everyone is 100% lovable, even if they don't do, even if I don't like what they do, I don't like what they say. It doesn't matter. That's on me. That's my work in the world to figure out why I have preferences for other people when people are doing the best that they can and living the lives that they're meant to live for themselves, right? So in our life coaching school program, our life coach school certification program, toward the end, we were required to create a little two minute promo video on one of the concepts from the life coach school. And so these are you know, amateur. Um, and we were all super nervous. I created a Facebook group for our small cohort of, of sisters. I call them my life coach uh, certification 2018 sisterhood sisters. And uh, the first, and we decided we were all going to share our videos on our Facebook group and give each other feedback. And we we're all nervous about our little two minute videos, uh, teaching a concept from the life coach school. And the first one that came through was from Kim, who's not here, Kim Fulgate. And I was, oh, here's the first one. I hadn't even done mine yet. And I watched it and I cried. And I was so moved by the passion and the depth which, which, with which I felt that Kim shared her belief that we are all 100% lovable and the passion and the depth which, with which she taught in this little two minute video that we are all 100% lovable. And what she teaches is that how much someone else loves us is reflective of their capacity for loving. It is not reflective of our lovability because we are 100% lovable. So I want to show you Kim's video. It's only two minutes. I hope that you enjoy it. Here we go. There we go. Hi, I'm Kim Fulgate, and today we're going to talk about lovability. What is lovability? So. Let's break it down this way. I want you to think about a relationship that you're in or maybe one from your past where you just didn't feel loved enough and you were trying to do and say all the right things to become more lovable. And I'm guessing, in fact, I'm certain that it just never worked out. You never felt more love. And here's why. Lovability has nothing to do with you and everything to do with the other person's capability to love. Wait, what? Yeah, lovability has nothing to do with you, sister, and everything to do with the other person's capability to love. So we can stop trying trying to be right, to be enough, to be perfect, so that we're lovable. Because you can't change that. The second you were conceived, the moment you arrived in this world, you were, you were and always are 100% lovable. Once we can accept that, we can stop trying to become more lovable and just receive the love that the other person has to give without judgment. Sounds pretty good, right? So, you want to chat about it? You want to learn more? Contact me here. I'd love to. See you there. All right. So I hope you enjoyed Kim's little video on lovability. I adore her and I adore everyone all of you, I love you are all 100% lovable. I love you all. There's so much love avail available in the world. And if we stop thinking that anybody is less worthy of love, 
than anybody else, then we will just infuse the world with love. That is my opinion and my belief. And if Kim spoke to you and you connect with her and what she said resonated with you, um, I, I encourage you to reach out to her. Kim especially works with coaching people who have a relationship with, with Jesus Christ, and that's her passion and her, her niche. So I would love to promote Kim with you if that, if that is of interest to you. All right, we are moving on. So we have finished the first of my three concepts, which was self-love and lovability. So again, you are 100% lovable. And the most important person for you to love the most in the world is you, is to work on your self-love and to tell yourself that you love yourself. Tell yourself, my coach, Dr. Deb Butler, who I love, who's also a life coach, school coach, who I've been coaching with for a couple of years now, she tells us to even use terms of endearment for ourselves in our own mind. With Dr. Deb, I did the weight loss work and lost weight with her, and she was amazing, and she helped me lose the weight I needed to lose. And she would say that when we go off our plan and we do something we don't wanna do, that we need to talk with ourselves with complete love and say, it's okay, sweetheart. It's okay, honey. It's okay, love. You're going to do fine. You're going to get back on track. You're going to, you're going to be able to succeed. Sweetheart, you are beautiful. You are wonderful. Dear, my dear one, you are doing great. Two steps, one step back, two steps forward. It's all okay. You're amazing. You're beautiful. Sweetheart, I love you. That's what she would encourage me to say. And it sounded questionable at first. And I had a really hard time doing it at first. And once I learned to do that, I was able to give that to myself instead of seeking it from other people. Because just as Kim said, if we're constantly seeking it for other, from other people and twisting ourselves around to be lovable enough to be what they want us to be, it'll never work because everyone's going to have a different idea of what they think we should be for them to love us. We love ourselves. We are hundred percent lovable. It's other people's capacity to love us that determines how much they can love us, not our lovability. Okay, so we are going to move into the concept of unconditional love, okay? So now we're moving into, so the first point was really all about self-love and our own lovability. The second point is about our capacity for loving others and we, we want to be committed to growing in our capacity to love others unconditionally, right? All world religions and spiritual traditions and self-help traditions talk about the concept of unconditional love, right? So I think I saw a question or comment. So before, whoops, oh, I gave you the answer. Before I go on to unconditional love, I'm going to see what folks are saying. How would we be able to determine how lovable the other person is? Great question. Same answer. Everyone is 100% lovable when they are born, right? So some people in their life are mistreated. Some people are abused. Some people uh, have challenges, right? It doesn't matter. Everyone is still 100% lovable, okay? Regardless of all of that. Again, it doesn't mean that you have to choose to have that person in your life. It doesn't mean that you have to put up with abuse. No one should ever put up with abuse. That is a separate issue, okay? So all of what I'm talking about, please know that none of it is to suggest that you should put up with anything that you feel is not acceptable and that you have clear boundaries. And if you, have, if you know that you're 100% lovable and have high self-worth and self-esteem, you're going to have clear boundaries with other people about what you'll accept and not accept because you know you're 100% lovable. But you can see someone else as 100% lovable whether or not you want to spend time with that person or have them in your life. And you can make a request of that person as well. You can say, I would like to ask you not to speak to me that way, whatever you want. But whether or not they do is reflective of them, not you, because you are 100% lovable. But so are they, regardless of what they do. It's a it can be a very difficult concept to wrap our minds around. And I really want to encourage you to listen to the Life Coach School podcast. It's free. There are over 300 episodes. I have listened to every single one. I've listened to many of them multiple times, okay? Look for the podcast on unconditional love. Watch the podcast on 
unconditional, uh, watch the videos on unconditional love. I'm happy to share all of it with you. It's all online, super easy to find. Brooke Castillo, she talks about lovability, 100% lovability and unconditional love to a great extent and goes into a lot of depth and I'm just giving you the basic introduction to it. So you already saw the answer to this, I think. What percentage of the time is unconditional love without condition? No requirements for what you do or don't do, what you say or don't say, even how you treat me because that's my job to create a boundary. If you treat me in a way that's unacceptable to me, then I, if I have healthy self-esteem and self-worth, which I may need to work, I may need therapy, I may need to work on that. This is not things that we can always, these are not always things we can change overnight, right? But that's what we were striving for. Then I create the boundaries to take care of myself, but I can still feel unconditional love for you. So what is the answer? What percentage of the time is unconditional love an option? Yes! <laughs> Hi, Cindy. <laughs> what unconditional love is an option? 100% of the time, no matter what anyone else does, does we have the capacity to love people unconditionally to say, I don't like what this person does. I don't like what this person says. I, even I don't want this person in my life or I need to ask this person for something different. We can still love that person unconditionally. We can see that they are a product of their life experience, not of doing what we think they should do, right? We were not, you know, the pe pers people who raised that person. We didn't have control over everything that shaped who that person became, right? So we can choose to feel unconditional love for that person no matter what they do. This is a really, really hard concept. I have struggled to feel unconditional love for people who I disagree with, for people who I think you know, make choices that are, are unimaginable, right? And, and have views and beliefs and ways of treating other people that I would never choose and that I disagree with, you know, adamantly. But think about this. When we are hateful towards someone else in our own mind, in our own heart, and they don't even know it, who are we hurting? Who are we hurting? You know the answer, ourselves. If I feel hate towards someone else and they have no idea, I'm only hurting myself. It is painful. I am creating self-suffering when I feel hatred, when I feel angry, when I feel annoyed, when I'm perturbed by what someone else is doing. That, that takes away my energy and my joy in the world. And if the other person doesn't know, it doesn't do anything to them, right? It's been compared to taking poison and expecting the other person to die. Now, let's say... That person does know I hate them. I don't like them. I don't like what they do. Then I'm causing even more suffering, aren't I? I'm causing my suffering and I'm trying to inflict suffering on that other person. Rather than it's always an option to make a loving request, to draw a loving boundary, to exit a relationship. Okay, maybe it's not always an option. Again, I want to, I want to have the disclaimer. If there's abuse, if there's manipulation, that is a different issue. That is not what we're talking about here. And that's outside the bounds of, of what we're covering in this workshop. And I recognize that, okay? But a lot of the time, and in the cases that we're talking about here, we have the option to choose 100% unconditional love, 100% of the time for the people in our life, whether or not we want them in our lives, right? And I'm gonna give you a really, I think, pretty powerful example, an extreme example of exactly this so that when you think well okay bridget i can practice unconditional love 90 percent of the time 80 percent of the time go ahead and quantify it in your mind okay and for everyone except this one person they drive me crazy they need to change right they're not going to change okay maybe they are maybe you make a loving request and they change that's that's an option that's great if that happens but most of the time people report you know that 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 they need to accept that the other person is gonna be who they are and figure out what, what, I, what am I gonna do about the fact that this is who you are? Am I gonna choose unconditional love, right? Here's a really powerful example. I want you to imagine this scenario. This is from a TED Talk. And I'm gonna show you the TED Talk in a minute. A woman and her husband and their two kids are home together having a family night, dinner, activities, whatever it might've been. And the 
there's a lot of noise coming from the house next door. Suddenly there's a big party going on there and it's really disruptive and they can't, you know, have their fun family night. They can't hear anything. So the dad decides to go over to the house and knock on the door and, you know, ask if they can just turn the music down and keep the noise down a little bit. He's gone for a really long time. And the, the mother, the mom starts wondering what's going on. More time passes, more time passes. You can probably guess where this is going. And I'm sorry to say that if you're thinking the worst, it's true. What happened was someone at the party was incredibly drunk, inebriated, out of his mind, and somehow got angry that this person was coming and telling them to turn down the music and the sound and violently, brutally beat this man to death. Imagine this, okay? Would it be possible to feel love for that person? I would want to say, I'm sure we would all want to say no. That person who beat this man to death, this father of children who came over just to ask for them to quiet the music down, that person is unlovable. That person is not worthy of unconditional love, right? Well, guess what? I want to share this woman's story with you. This is a TED Talk. I highly recommend you watch it. I was shocked when I revisited it and found that it only has 300,000 views because it rocked my world and it changed the way I view love and the potential for unconditional love. So here's this woman's story. I shared the beginning of the story with her with you. Let me read a little bit from this talk very briefly and see what you think about this. After Ryan was arrested, she says, I was sitting in a small interrogation room about to meet the young man that killed my husband. I thought my heart would come out of my chest. I expected some kind of monster to walk through the door. I didn't expect to see a young man that could be my son or your son or somebody's best friend. He sat across from me, slumped over, sobbing. I handed him ball after ball of tissue. It was all I could do not to cross over to the other side and give him a hug because he looked like that was what he needed. Does it sound a little bit almost like she felt love for this man who killed her husband? She continued to visit him. She continued to get to know him and understand what experiences could lead him to do something so horrific in a moment that took away the man who was the father of her children. She says, of one of, their converse, one of their many conversations, ultimately, it was an opportunity for us to find some humanity around a situation that to this point had been anything but humane. I don't think Ryan went out that day with the intention of killing somebody. I understand how he made a series of poor choices through his adolescence and teen years that culminated in a fatal choice that brought our lives together. When Ryan was a small child, he had a speech impediment. He was picked on and bullied in school. His parents divorced. He didn't know where he belonged. His best friend was killed in a drunk driving crash. The more time we spent together, the more we realized we had things in common. Because that's what happens when you share space with someone. We talked about the things that mattered to us, our families, the things we loved. We loved the outdoors. We discovered we had a mutual interest in art. One day he went back to his cell and he brought back a sketchbook. This is after many visits while he's in jail to show me his artwork. He showed me his drawings. I brought my laptop and I showed him the presentation that I developed for youth around social responsibility. And I said to him that it's a powerful message, but it occurs to me that it's only part of the story. And perhaps he would like to share his story. When Ryan got out of jail, he and I worked together for years, sharing his story with thousands of kids in DC. They worked together for years going into schools to talk to kids about violence, about avoiding violence, about restorative practices, conflict resolution, love, 
between two people in these circumstances. Can you imagine? So when people say to me, I can't love this person, I can't feel unconditional love for this person, I think of this TED Talk every single time. And I say, I don't know. I have a really hard time believing that we cannot transcend all and choose unconditional love regardless of circumstances. This was after the fact, right? There was nothing that could be changed about the loss of this woman's husband. She still had the capacity in her heart to feel unconditional love for this person. I'm not saying I could do that. I don't know, honestly, right? In my in my experience, I have nothing like this to draw upon, but I am inspired by her every single day that I feel frustrated and annoyed and stressed by other people. And because they're not doing what I think they should be doing, I think of her and I think unconditional love is available. She felt it for him. We can feel it for anyone. So I'm seeing a couple comments. Um, unconditional love is not only the best thing we can do for ourselves, oftentimes, the people in our lives that are struggling can benefit from knowing they are unconditionally loved. Yes, 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 Gina. That is from Gina, my fellow certified life coach. And, and Gina and I have been steeped in these concepts. What you're getting a few minutes of, we've had countless hours, hundreds of hours really of content shared with us um, virtually and live in all of our programs. It's not just for us, it's for others. It's to spread unconditional love in the world is healing for others. This is what this woman did for this man in jail. She talks later about how when he became a father, she was happy for him and he was devastated because he could understand on a whole new level what he had done to her children by taking their father away, right? It is always available for us to heal ourselves and to heal others in the world, to, to work to, to create unconditional love in the world and to put unconditional love in the world. Now, here is an obstacle to unconditional love. My next point under unconditional love, something called manuals. If you are familiar with the work of the Life Coach School, you know about manuals. If you're not, I highly recommend you listen to the Life Coach School podcast on manuals, you watch the video on manuals. Manuals are rule books that we have for what we think other people should do. So manuals are a good idea for our car, right? The op operating manual for a car or an employee manual when you start a new job. Manuals for human beings do not work. The manuals we have for human beings are usually these thick, hefty books, right? With all these rules, you should do this, you shouldn't say these things, you shouldn't tell these kinds of jokes. If I look good, you should comment on how I look, right? I used to have, when I first got married 26 years ago, my manual for my husband was insane, right? It's all gone now. Um, and he's amazing, you know, but his manual is his manual, right? We don't get to create manuals for everybody else. How could we have a manual for everybody else in our life and expect them to follow it, right? So the question is, Next question, answered every question is a number, right? I already gave you the answer. How many people in our lives should we have operating manuals for? Zero, 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 none. No operating manuals. When we free ourselves of our manuals, we can be so much more peaceful and happy and they can be so much more peaceful and happy and we can live in harmony whether or not we ever see those people. Our manuals do not work for human beings, okay? And so I was so passionate about this concept that I chose, remember earlier I showed you my sister, my Life Coach School sister graduate, Kim Folgate's um, little promo uh, video that we had to do when we were graduating from Life Coach School. I chose to do my little two minute promo video on not having manuals for other people because I was able to see that that was the change I made in my own marriage that caused it to be healed from so much strife and so much pain and arguing and and so many unrealistic expectations early on. And then I was able to, you know, with my husband's help, it takes two, you know, heal our marriage and, and rebuild a happy marriage when I let go of my manuals for him and loved him as he was. So I wanna share that with you, but first, if you think we're, we should be able to have manuals, also think about manuals in time because they change, don't they? Here's what the manual, think about what the manual was in the 1950s for a wife. How ridiculous, right? This woman is sitting with her pearls and her fancy dress in looking like she's just feeling blissful in her kitchen because she's about to beat these eggs, right? Today, we're horrified by this and think it's ridiculous, but it's a manual. And that was the manual that many people had for what a wife should be in the 50s, right? So manuals just don't work. We need to be who we are. Of course, we need to work to be good people and kind people and compassionate people. But when we're looking at how we 
um, judge others and create manuals for others, it simply doesn't help and it doesn't work. So I'm gonna show you, very amateur, remember this is over a year ago um, when I was graduating from the Life Coach School and we had to create a two minute promo video on one of the concepts from the Life Coach School. So I decided to do manuals, don't laugh, I know it's really, really amateur, but this is my little two minute video on manuals, so take a look. Hey, can I vent to you for just a minute about my husband? Thanks. Last night, I got home from work and I was really upset about something and he knew it, but he just left me alone. He didn't even ask me if I wanted to talk about how I was feeling. And he does that kind of thing all the time. So insensitive, right? It's as if he never read my manual. Cut. None of that was true. I was acting to demonstrate the concept of the manual. A manual is an invisible, usually unspoken, large set of rules and expectations that we have for another person. And we blame our feelings on whether or not that person is doing everything we have in this manual. The truth is, life doesn't work that way. We are responsible for our own feelings. When I first got married, I had a hefty manual for my poor husband, and all it ever caused us was disappointment, conflict, pain, and suffering. I had to learn that reasonable requests and healthy boundaries are great, but manuals need to go. When I let go of my manual for my husband, I was finally able to see what an amazing person he is, the kind, loving, generous, smart human being he is, just as he was. We've been married for 25 years now, raised two kids, and we're happier than ever with no manuals. Who do you have manuals for? Your partner, colleagues, siblings, parents, kids? Are you ready to experience the freedom and peace that come with letting go of those manuals? The energy it can free up? We can help. Let's talk. So there's my little manual video. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it has two or three views. So <laughs> if you want to share it, feel free. Uh, okay, hang on. Let me get to, back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so I think we had a question. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. We had a comment in the chat box. So let me, let's see. Here we go. Okay. Oh, thank you, Gina. <laughs> okay, so Gina, um, yeah, so Gina was in my class. So she has her two-minute video also, which is, you know, they were all awesome and amazing um, and super fun. And, and it was a great, such a great experience. Um, so... I, that brings to a close the second of my three concepts. So we started with self-love. We're 100% lovable. We need to love ourselves first, love ourselves up, fill ourselves up with love. The second concept was unconditional love, right? That we, 100% of the time, unconditional love is an option for everyone in our lives, regardless of who they are, what they do. We don't have to be with them. We don't have to have anything to do with them, but we can still choose to feel unconditional love for them. And they get to be who they are. They don't have to follow our manual. We don't get to write a manual for other people and tell them what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And again, my manual for my husband was ridiculous when we first got married. I got dressed up. He should notice. He should comment. That's not him. He's, he didn't notice. He did other things. He, you know, people are who they are. When we love them for who they are, um, and we're loving ourselves and filling ourselves up with love, we're not so needy for all this affirmation and recognition for, uh, from other people. We recognize that, that they're beautiful as they are, and we can love them as they are. So that brings to a close the second concept, and I'm going to move in pretty good on time into the third concept, which is romantic love, love in relationships, romantic love, sexual love, intimate love, whatever you want to call it. So any questions about the previous concepts before I move into that? Let me know. Okay, here's my question for you. Whoops, what percent of your tank so think of your filling yourself up with love as a fuel tank in your car and filling yourself up with your own activities and joy in life and things that you do that bring meaning for you. What percent of your tank are we supposed to fill? This comes from John Gray and all the men are from Mars, women are from Venus, whether you like him or not, doesn't matter. 
I'm sharing this concept with you as something I teach and I believe firmly. So what percentage of your tank should you fill with your own love and your own pleasure and joy and pursuits and activities and whatever it is you love in your life? And what percent do you think your partner can realistically fill for you? So I saw a guess. Whoops. Ah. <laughs> Ooh, I love it. Zero, zero. I love it. I love your answer better than mine. So mine is 10%. Well, actually, John Gray's is 10%. And I saw in the chat box that most of you said 0%, which is, I think, even better. Okay. But the we'll look at both, right? So yes, many experts on love relationships say that we need to come to our love relationship 100% whole, like healthy, healed, whole, in love with ourselves, in love with our life the way it is, with or without a partner, 100%, okay? So that's one way to look at it. And then we come together as two 100% whole people to love each other up and just, just not to get love, but to just give love because we're so full of love. And then the love just goes back and forth between both people, right? But what John Gray says is that if you get to 90%, then that 10% of having a partner is kind of like topping off your fuel tank, or in other words, he calls it the icing on the cake. Whoops, the icing on the cake. So here we have a yummy looking cake, right? Um, just that little bit extra in life when we're really, really full with our own life and ourself and what we're doing in our lives, and we're so proud of ourselves and, and happy. And there are so many studies that prove this, okay? If you've heard of Robert Holden, Dr. Robert Holden, who's a psychologist, does a lot of speaking, is very involved with Hay House. Um, he talks so much about this. And he said there was a longitudinal study to determine if people were happy or married or unmarried. And they found all this you know, evidence that married people were happier, but then they dug into it and they looked at those people's lives before they were married and found that they were happy before they were married, those same people. So there was no cause effect relationship. They were just happy people, whether they were not married or married. And then another study shows that people's levels of happiness tend to go up a little bit when they get married and then they go back down and level out to whatever they were before, right? So all this nonsense we see in all these romantic movies and you complete me and Jerry Maguire, please don't let that go into your brain because it is simply not true, okay? The reality is we have to be full of self-love and self-joy and have pursuits that we love in life and then our partner, whatever you want to choose to believe, you know, can fill that extra 10% or is just like icing on the cake when you're already at 100%. And if you don't believe me and you don't believe John Gray, and you don't believe all these studies, take a look at some of these amazing people and what they have to say on this topic. And I posted some of this on social media in promoting this video. I love Michelle Obama. She just told Oprah, she was just on Super Soul Conversations with Oprah. And I got so excited when she said, I am responsible for my own happiness. I didn't marry Barack Obama for him to make me happy. I think that's amazing because I love Barack Obama. And I think, well, wow, if he was her, you know, if he was my husband, he's amazing if he were my husband. Um, but no, she's, she realizes she's got her book and her life and her speaking, right? Science proves that marriage doesn't make people happy, study after study, right? Here's Brooke Castillo and her husband. She also has had a very long and fruitful marriage and talks about how she had so many unrealistic expectations of her husband in the beginning and she learned to love herself and love her life and build her business and she's so successful and she has this wonderful relationship with her husband because as she says here, it's not your spouse's job to make you feel love. It's your job and your opportunity to love yourself and love your life. And then your spouse can, you know, make, make that, make it all a little bit more fun and enjoyable. Right. And I love uh, people like Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson. When I was uh, younger, I had the biggest crush on Tom Hanks. So to me, he was like the perfect husband, but here she says, we think of like all this romance and Hollywood people. No, we just like to hang out at home in our sweatpants, right? So pretty realistic um, picture of what long-term love is. They've been married over 30 years, right? How it's not about someone completing me and all this romance and, you know, um, the things we see in the movies. It's about we're happy with ourselves and we can, you know, we can lay around together and watch movies and, and absolutely love each other and love the romance and love all of that. But that is the extra. That is not what's meant to fill us up. We're meant to fill ourselves up. So that's, that's my last thought on that. And here is the very last point. And this one, so important, so tough to wrap our heads around. Okay. How much 
of your love is caused by what the other person does or does not do. What percentage of how much, so how much I love my husband, right? I would want to think before I went through the life coach school and learned all these concepts, I would think, well, a lot of how much I love him is because he's so kind and he's so reliable and because he's a great father for our kids and he makes a great living and supports us, right? How much I love him is a function of the things that he does, right? And that's what I thought and that's what I truly believed. And guess what I learned and what I now believe that how much I love him is 0% based on what he does or doesn't do. Crazy idea, right? If it's not based on what he does or doesn't do, what the heck is it based on? Well, I'm gonna give you the answer, but I'm gonna tell you that most people find this really hard to understand at first and because it comes from something called the self-coaching model, which I teach, which is taught in the life coach school, which we all know in the life coach school, which many of you have heard me talk about and been to my workshops on. And what the self-coaching model teaches us that I strongly encourage you to get a lot more information on it's on the podcast or videos on it, is that our feelings and love is a feeling are created by our thoughts. What we think creates what we feel. So my love for my husband is a hundred percent caused by what I'm thinking about my husband. And I always get to choose what I think about my husband. So for example, my husband's supposed to take out the trash. He doesn't take it out. If I choose to think, what a jerk, he doesn't help out, I do everything, those are thoughts, right? That, those thoughts are probably going to lead me to feel anger and disappointment and upset. My husband doesn't take the trash out. I choose to think, oh, you know what? He had a really busy day. He worked so hard. He's such a good supporter. He worked so many hours. No big deal. He didn't take the trash out. What do I feel? I feel love and appreciation for him because of what I'm choosing to think. It's not what he did. It's what I'm choosing to think. And I'm not saying we should always choose to think positive thoughts about what other people do if we don't like it. I might also choose to think, hmm, I don't like that, but that's on me. You know, so I'm going to ask him lovingly, hey, you didn't take the trash out. Would you mind taking it out? Right? It's not an excuse to lash out and be angry and to mistreat people because it's all coming from my thoughts. I think I saw a question. So let me, or a comment. So from Gina, yeah, for those of us that are single people, are there people out there that are easier for us to love? Ooh, such a good question, Gina, versus people that are harder for us to love. Okay, so remember, everyone is 100% lovable. And whether or not we love someone is what we're choosing to think about them. So I would say, I would say honestly, yes and no. There, there are people that are easier for us to love because they follow our manuals more, but we're supposed to throw away our manuals to evolve as human beings, to evolve to a higher level for ourselves, right? And then there are people that are easier for us to love because they're more similar to us, they follow our manual, right? But really, the answer should be no, that we have the capacity to have unconditional love for 100% of the people, and 100% of the people are 100% lovable. But that's like the goal that we're striving for, right? Most of us, myself included, are not there yet, but I believe that it's a worthy goal to strive for, right? And there are people who are no longer in my life, who I, not many, I mean, I really work with myself to try to love everyone and, and repair relationships and keep relationships healthy, but there are people who are no longer part of my life, who I, you know, don't want to have in my life, who I feel total unconditional love for and wish them all the best in their life separate from my life. So here's, I want to give you a really powerful example of what I'm saying here. And so great. Okay. So that was, okay. So that, so the answer was acceptable. I think it was a bit of a convoluted answer that I gave you, but it's a tough question and it really is a yes and a no, because as, as flawed human beings who are hundred percent lovable, um, we're working toward getting there and we're often not able to fully be there and that's okay. We're hundred percent lovable, even though we're not hundred percent able to give unconditional love. We're working on it. We're moving toward it. It probably wasn't something that was modeled for us and taught to us. So we have to love ourselves through that work and trying to get there. Now, 
This is Brooke Castillo. You all know I love, love, love Brooke Castillo. I'm obsessed with her. She is one of my greatest teachers in life. She is the founder of the Life Coach School. These are, this is a picture from me getting life coached by Brooke in her program, Self Coaching Scholars, which was an amazing experience. It was just mind blowing for me to be coached by her live and her to teach me how I can manage my own mind and live my life in love and take responsibility for how I was feeling about the very difficult situation that I shared with her. And I, I, I put that up there just to say that I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove to you that what I just said is true with an example that Brooke recently gave in a coaching session in her self-coaching scholars program where she coached a woman about her feelings about her husband. And here I'm trying to prove to you with one last example that the love we feel or don't feel for someone is 0% based on really what that person actually does or doesn't do. It's based on what we're thinking about what they do or don't do and what we're choosing to think about what they do or don't do. So take a look. I'm going to show you this line by line, what, what came out of this uh, fascinating coaching session and how Brooke shared this with us in an email, those of us who get her emails. So this is Brooke speaking. I coached a woman in scholars today. This is her self-coaching scholars program. Highly recommend it. She told me her husband was rude. She said this upset her. So see where we already see the, the factors, right? Her husband is rude as a thought. It's not a fact. She's choosing to think that. The feeling that results from that thought is she's upset. She's generating her own upset by telling herself that her husband's rude. I asked for an example. So Brooke will always say, okay, give me a specific example we can work with because so far you're just giving me thoughts and perceptions. She told me something her husband said. So now we have a specific example, okay, of something he said. Then I asked her to imagine a super hot guy that she's infatuated with saying the same thing. Would she think it was rude? Would it upset her? No, it wouldn't bother her at all. This is what the woman said. She just stared at me. I have some work to do, she said. And that was that. And this is the kind of powerful thing that happens in life coaching. These moments happen all the time with my clients when I'm coaching. It's so powerful and so amazing. And, and Brooke is the master. She's our master coach. And you can see that in just this moment, she shifted everything for this woman and helped her see it's not about her husband. Her husband's not rude. She's, her husband is probably the same person he was when she married him, right? And thought he was fantastic, right? But things change over years. The, the honeymoon period is supposed to only last up to a year. And then we start all of a sudden taking the blinders off and seeing all the flaws and, and, and perfect imperfection that we all are, right? So the way we feel about our romantic partners is because of what we're thinking about them. And this is why so many people leave their partner for another partner because it's easier to think positive thoughts about somebody new than that person you've been with forever and really, really know their ins and outs and their flaws and their, and their, and their great qualities, right? So I'm not saying that we should stay with someone if we're no longer compatible. It's totally an option to split up, to get divorced, to say this person's not the right person, or this person, you know, doesn't uh, meet my expectations for how I want to be treated in the world. That's great. Do that by all means. But I would still say you can release that person with love, with unconditional love to go out into the world and hopefully grow and develop in whatever way they are meant to, right? But remember that whether or not you're feeling loving feelings toward your partner is not because of what they do. It's because of what you're thinking about them. And this is the perfect example where this woman just had to go, ooh, I'm thinking my husband's rude. That's a choice. If someone else said and did the same thing and it wasn't my husband, it was this hot guy, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Think about that. The next time you're annoyed with someone, think about if your favorite celebrity or politician or you know someone you love most in the world said or did the same thing, you probably wouldn't be upset by it. So it's our thoughts that create our feelings, not what other people do. And those are only two of the five factors in the self-coaching model. If you want more on that, let me know. There's so much to it, but that's, that's how it functions in our relationships. And that has been one of the most healing and exciting ways that I have, you know, I was going to say rekindled my marriage. I wouldn't say it needed to be rekindled, but my husband and I have both done deep study and deep work on the self-coaching model and realizing that our thoughts create our feelings. And we're so 
happy with each other. We're so loving with each other. We don't fight anymore. Um, we make requests of each other. Of course, this doesn't mean everything's like acceptable to you. We make loving requests, but we don't have these problems anymore because it's like, oh, you get to be you. You do you. I do me. We're 90% filling ourselves up or 100% filling ourselves up, then coming together in love, totally unconditionally accepting and loving each other as we are, right? And realizing that if we feel annoyed, which we still do, or angry or disappointed, it's because of our own thoughts. Work to change those thoughts. Is there an opportunity? Is there an opening to change that thought, to feel loving? A lot of times there is. I'll be mad at my husband. I'll be like, oh, it's because I'm thinking he should have done this. He should have said that. He shouldn't have that. I could just let that go and realize that that's my manual. He, he, he didn't mean it that way. I don't like what he just said, but if I try to think of it from his perspective, he only meant this, let it go. I feel loving toward him. Everything's great again. Sometimes it's really that easy, believe it or not. And other times it takes a lot more work. I get it. I am not claiming to be perfect in this area by any means, but that is the final concept I wanted to share with you. So we talked about self-love, you are number one in your own life, loving yourself first. Yes, even above, or if you push me on it, maybe on par with your kids, but you gotta love yourself number one first. You are 100% lovable and so is everyone else, okay? And we talk about unconditional love. Everyone on the planet is 100% worthy of unconditional love and we have the capacity to love everyone else on the planet 100% unconditionally. Don't have to have them in our lives, but we have that ability. We do not get to write up manuals. And by the way, those manuals are often unspoken. Those conversations, I can't even have these conversations anymore, right? Where someone says, this person did this and I can't believe they did that and said that. And yet that person doesn't tell the other person that they had any expectation for them to do or say that. It's this unspoken manual. How unfair is that? Why don't you give the person a chance and say, this is what I expect from you or could you please do this and then judge them. I would say still don't judge them because you don't get to have a manual for other people. I don't get to have a manual for other people, right? So manuals are these unspoken big books of rules we have for other people. We need to let them go. Zero percent of the time are manuals serving us or other people, right? And uh, the final concept on romantic love, really healthy romantic love relationships and I'm not talking about the first year, and I'm not even talking about the first five years. I'm sorry to say, but as someone who has been in a committed relationship for 30 years with so many ups and downs, and, and Michelle Obama says this, you got to listen to that Super Soul podcast if you listen to those, that you know what, if you're in like a 50-year marriage, you might have like eight years that aren't good, you know, interspersed throughout but that's actually success, isn't it? And I would say that about my marriage. I'm not going to say how many years were bad, but there were lots of times where we were not happy with each other, right? It's not perfect all the time. That's not a realistic expectation. But now we know that the healthiest long-term marriages over time are people who have a really strong ability to love themselves and fill their lives up with their own activities and joys and really are 90 to 100 percent, I'll say, full up with their own life and then can come together in wholeness to share that life with a partner, right? And as Brooke shows us here, what we think about that partner is not because of what they do or don't do. It's because of what we're choosing to think. So whenever we can, why not choose thoughts of love and compassion and forgiveness and understanding of where that person is coming from? It's always an option. It's always our choice. So I will end and I will take questions if anybody's still on and wants to ask a question or make a comment. But I just want to end with, you know, as I said, my life coach, master coach instructor, life coach school, Brooke Castillo has been one of my greatest teachers. I have many, I've read hundreds and hundreds of books. I've written a book. I wrote my book, which has all of this in it. Ironically, in the chapter, chapter two is on romantic relationships. I didn't even know about Brooke Castillo and the life coach school when I read, when I wrote that. And it's uncanny to me when I read it again, that it's all consistent. It's all aligned with these same principles, but I learned so much more after that in this program, but how we feel is based on our thoughts about another person. Love is always an option. Please consider embracing that possibility in your life. So I think I saw a question. Whoops. Let me try to go back to the chat here. Here we go question or comment. Um, I like to think of the relationship I have with myself as marriage. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Yes. I am first 
married to myself. I am number one. I am my best partner, my best cheerleader. You know, my husband's away for the whole weekend. He's not here. He's not watching, right? I could have had a manual like, you should be in my workshop. You should be home supporting me as I get ready to do my love workshop. He's at a retreat with his um, business uh, accountability group. That's fantastic for the whole weekend. I'm so happy for him. So excited for him. You know, I fill my life up. He fills his life up. We have all kinds of amazing things that we do in our own lives. And when we come together, we're whole and we share whatever we can share with whatever time that we have, right? Um, people are amazed. You know, I also always use the example that um, my husband's on a search and rescue team. He's on the Malibu search and rescue team. So anytime we go out, he might have to leave. So we have the agreement to go rescue someone who's who's lost in the hills or hurt or, you know, in some dire circumstances. So we have an understanding that even when we go out to dinner, anytime, even if it's a big date night, whatever it is, if he gets a rescue call, he's going to leave. And then I, I get to choose what I want to do. You know, last time um, he was going to possibly go on a call, we were at a great shopping center having dinner. I was like, oh, I'll peruse the stores by myself. I'll take a lift ride home. No problem. I'm great with me. I'm great with him if he's here. It's all good either way. Um, oh boy, when we first got married, the first 10, 15, probably more years, that would not have been okay. And now I'm just amazed that I'm able to be in that place and it's so much more um, joy filled for me and for him and for everyone around us and our kids. It's just so much easier. It's, it's wonderful to live life that way. So I highly encourage it. Like throw away those manuals, love yourself up, love your life, love just being with you. And then if someone else is there to share some of it, great. So I love what Gina said about, um, you can conceptualize it as being married to yourself and you don't have to get married either. You know, um, you know, I am a huge LGBTQ advocate. I'm a huge advocate of love is love and one love and we are all love and, and all love is good love, right? So you don't have to get married. I love how Oprah talks about how she didn't want to get married because she felt like it would change the expectations placed on her, right? And that, that for her, that was right for her to stay with her partner. She, she says she's been with her partner Stedman since 1843 or something like that, right? Um, but, but didn't want to marry him. And that's cool. That's great. You know, whatever works, that allows us to be in love and stay in love for ourselves and for others. Any final questions or comments, my friends? Valuable information, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shari. I hope, I know you are all here because you are full of love and you are such loving people. I know you all and I know what amazing loving people you are. So I hope that this just enhanced that for you. I hope it didn't feel at any point judgmental. It, there is zero judgment. I am working on all of this in my own life and trying to um, reach higher levels of, of living life this way. I'm far from perfect. I recognize that. So I hope that there was something in here that allows you to go off in your day and feel more love and enjoy more love and share more love and spread more love in the world because I think we would all agree that that love is, is beautiful and uh, we should be spreading as much love as we can. So let's see what people are writing. Thank you for writing in. So Cindy says, thank you. I love you, Cindy. I love all of you. Thank you, Roderick. I appreciate what you had to say. Diane um, says, thank you. Love your spirit. Thank you. I love you all. I truly do. I have unconditional love for every one of you. If there's anything in this that was hard to swallow, that you disagree with, that you have a hard time with, please know it was shared in love. And I, I respect and honor if you have a different opinion. This is what I've learned. This is what I'm working to embrace. And I know it's really hard sometimes and never, never, never accept abuse, mistreatment. Please, please, please take care of yourself. Um, and, and know that if anything I said suggested other than that, that that was not my intention. Okay, I wanna thank you all for being here and release you to your Saturday. Have a wonderful Saturday. Spread the love, feel the love, look in the mirror, tell yourself how much you love yourself in your mind. Don't, they say 80% of our self-talk is negative. We're telling ourselves, I shouldn't do that, I'm terrible. Don't do it, love yourself, love, love, love yourself. Tell yourself how much you love yourself. Look in the mirror, do Louise Hayes mirror work. Look in the mirror and tell yourself you love yourself because if you can't do it with yourself, how can you expect anyone else to look at you with that love and love you? Love yourself so much and embrace the love from others. Love you all. 
Have a great Saturday. Come to my next workshop, March 8th. I am Remarkable, Google's Empowerment Initiative. It is so powerful. It's not going to be like this one at all. It is Google's initiative to help women and underrepresented groups speak up for themselves, be empowered. It's a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. I'm so passionate about it. I am so excited to share it at 10 a.m., another Zoom free right here, Saturday, March 8th. That's only, I think, two weeks away. So please come and please spread the word. You'll see me um, sharing it on social media and in our newsletter. Love to you all. Bye.